Stayallday.com. Stay now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative. What is that? That is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is, we are starting on part one of a quick two-part series where we're going to talk about six scary things that every entrepreneur must do with an asterisk to that statement. And I'll explain the asterisk in a second. But first, I remind everybody on formula. I send out a text message every day guaranteed to have you focus sharp and on point. I call it the daily motivation. You would like to receive that message. And you should. All you got to do is text me at my number, which is 305-384-6894. And also be sending out a Monday motivation every Monday as well. So if you want to get those messages, just text me at that number that I just gave you. Secondly, work on your game university. That is the only place I do any coaching, the only place I work with anyone directly. You want to be one of those people. We work with people who are top 2% performers or on your way to being one. So these are people who are uh, high level performers, high achievers, ambitious individuals. That's you. Go to workonyourgameuniversity.com and we'll tell you uh, what your options are for working with me directly. We'll get on a call with you free of charge, talk about where you're at, where you want to go, and we'll take it from there. That link along with the number to my text community that I just mentioned are both down below in the description to this episode. Secondly, no, that was secondly. Now, all that out the way. Now, let's get into the topic, which is six scary things every entrepreneur must do. Now, again, the asterisk is this is only for entrepreneurs who are looking to advance in their business. So if your business is where you want it to be and you're good with it, staying there and doing the same thing this year, next year and every year for the next 10 years that it did last year, then that's completely fine. But this series, the things I'm going to share here in this series, you don't need to do those things. Now, you can listen to this, but you don't need to do anything I'm going to share here if you're OK with your business staying exactly where it's at. Now, those of you who want your business to move forward and do a lot better than what it's doing right now, these things you will need to do. And these things are not going to be easy. They're not going to be comfortable. They will even be either a little bit or a lot scary for some of you. Okay? I'm throwing that out there right now. So this is what every entrepreneur must do. You want to move forward faster. You want to make more money and you want to step to a new level in your business. All right. I just described you these six things. I'm going to share the first three today and the next three tomorrow. You must do these. Got it? Point number one. Today's topic, once again, is six scary things every entrepreneur must do. Number one, and again, every, every forward-moving entrepreneur must do. Number one, delegate and invest in efficiency. This is a very important wording here that I'm giving you. Delegate and invest in efficiency. To move to your next level in business, the first thing you need to do is delegate tasks that you don't need to do personally and invest in getting those things done more efficiently. Now, let's be clear here. The goal here overall is for you to be focused on doing only the things that only you can do. That's the goal, that you want to spend as much of your time as possible in your business only doing the things that can only be done by you, which is for most entrepreneurs who I know, and I'm not talking about every entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs is a, a, a large, they run the gamut. Right? You got entrepreneurs at very high levels, entrepreneurs at very new levels. But there are more people at the lower end of the pyramid than are at the top end of the pyramid. So most of the entrepreneurs who I see are doing way too many things outside of the realm of your zone of genius, so to speak. And your, your, your money skills is another way that I describe it. Your money skills are the things that you can do that only you can do, at least for your business, that you could draw a full-time income from doing. Most people have full-time income level skills at maybe three things. If you're pretty good, you got three of them. If, you're, if you just have a tighter focus, you might only have two or one. It doesn't make you worse than the person who has three. Because you might be able to get more out of your one than another person gets out of their three. For example, for me, my money skills are writing, speaking to people individually, and speaking to groups. And this show, for example, is an example of speaking to groups. Writing is an example like a book or emails. And if you use on my email list, you see I write a considerable amount. I do a good amount of writing. <laughs> I do a lot. Somebody just emailed me today and they were saying, you should take your articles and put them into a book. I actually did that. I got a book called Dre Philosophy, Volume Zero. The book is 800 something pages. It would have made it longer, but uh, when we sent the book to the printer and we printed it through Amazon KDP, they told us that I had reached the maximum length that you can actually make a book. And we squeezed 
on every possible you know, parameter they had in order to get the pages to fit there. But we're going to do more books like that coming soon. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. One of the reasons I haven't gotten around to it, because I don't have the, uh, the manpower or the software power right now to do the compilation. I would have to do it myself, and I ain't doing it. Now, the first book, I had someone else do it. There was a, a, a VA service that I was using. They actually did all the compilations, but the next one, I want to do it a little bit better and a little bit different. So when I get the right manpower in place to do things the way that I want it done, then that'll be coming. So anyway, that was a, a tangent that I went on here. The whole point is investing in getting things done more efficiently means more efficiently does not mean better than you. It just means you being able to focus on only what you can do because that produces a higher return on investment anyway. You want to pass everything else off to others, whether the others be other people or it be software. Because these days, there's a lot of things that software can do that used to be only done by people, but now software is able to kind of step up and do some things. So we just talked about that in the AI series, episodes 2759 through 2763. It was just a, a week or two ago. This is where applications, artificial intelligence, of course, assistance from humans, other software, and your staff can come into play. You just need to know first, before you do any of this, what task can you pass off to someone else versus what task should you keep for yourself? As a rule of thumb, the tasks that can only be done by you are usually very few, and they're also very high leverage and high ROI activities. So for example, as I gave you one already, I'm the only one who should be recording episodes of this show, even though I could write out notes and tell someone kind of exactly what to say, I don't want anyone else recording this. Uh, my voice, my uh, energy, my approach, all of that is part of this, part of the, the appeal of the Work On Your Game Show. I don't want anybody else putting this material out there. This is not something I would delegate to another person. LeBron James, for example, should not delegate playing any games to somebody other than himself. The reason that this delegation part is scary for some of you, not all of you, is because delegate means to give up control, to not be able to watch over everything in detail anymore. It also means you are now using your money to buy time. Even if you get software to replace you instead of a human to replace you, you are still using your money to buy time because the software that you're going to pay for ain't free. It's generally cheaper than humans, but you still have to pay something. And if I was to tell you how much we spend every month over here at Working Your Game Incorporated on software to get things done that we don't have to do with our hands, it's in the it's several thousand dollars a month we spend on software. And I only had a number right here in front of me because I'm often adding more stuff. When I see something that can help us, I'll add that on to it. But the whole point is now you're using your money to buy time. And a lot of people, especially in Western society, have a very strong emotional attachment to their money and don't like to see it leaving their account, even if. That money leaving the account could actually set you up to do things that will bring even more money back. But again, people, emotions are not rational or logical. So the whole thing is that's why this is scary. And for those of you who have never done any delegation, and you've done pretty well doing it all on your own. Okay, this is really scary for you because you're giving up control to another human who might not be as good as you. And here's the point, folks. They don't have to be as good as you. They just got to be able to get it done. And again, if they're doing something that is not one of your money skills, who cares if they're not as good as you? They ain't got to be perfect. I have an assistant who does a lot of my posting. Most of my posting that goes to social media is done by my assistant. I create all the material. Those are me on the videos. That's my writing that she is posting, and she does it. Now, has she made some mistakes? Yes, she has. Is she as good as I am at posting? Probably not. But does it matter? No, it doesn't matter because who cares? I don't get paid for posting on social media. So if she's 80% as good as me, I will catch when she makes a mistake and say, don't do it that way, do it this way. But if she made that mistake, it's not like I got to pay Instagram for my mistake. Right? It doesn't matter. So this is where you got to be clear on what's the good enough point. Where is good enough good enough in your business? You need to know the answer to this question. Where is good enough good enough? That's episode 2177, by the way. So that you know which areas you're okay with someone being 80% as good as you and which areas where you need to be 100%. And here's where the stubbornness of entrepreneurs come in, is that they'll have 17 things on the list of things that they got all got to be done 100 percent. And I say, you know, we got to we got to work on this because we're going to get this down to three and other 14. 80 percent is OK. Is that scary? Is that uncomfortable? Is even thinking about that scary or uncomfortable for some of you? Good. It's supposed to be. All right. That's why you need to be in work on your game university instead of trying to figure things out on your own. So instead of putting more of your own effort into things again now you're going to leverage other people and uh, stuff software 
And again, this is very hard for people who've never done it before, or those of you who are, you know, once bitten, twice shy. You've had other people do it before, you didn't do so well, and now you're kind of gun shy about doing it again. Well, you can be gun shy all you want, but we're using that gun. All right, we're going to figure this out. Point number two, today's topic, once again, are six scary things every forward-moving entrepreneur needs to do. Number two, eliminate low-value clients and customers. Oh, this is a big one right here. Eliminate low-value clients and customers. Now, this point is somewhat misleading, I'll admit, because it doesn't mean that those clients and customers that I'm referring to, it doesn't mean they have to completely disappear. It doesn't mean you can't help them anymore. It doesn't mean they got to they gotta leave your world and they can never you know, engage with you ever again. When I say eliminate them, what I mean is, let's just keep the number simple. If you have a $1 product and you decide that your minimum price now is going to get raised to $10, you got to let all the $1 clients and customers know that the minimum price now is $10. So either A, all of you can 10x your investment from $1 to $10, or B, I can refer you to someone else who can serve you, but it ain't going to be me anymore because the minimum is $10. So if you want to keep paying $1, I'll send you to somebody else who will take your $1, but I ain't accepting $1 anymore. You got to pay 10 That's what I mean by eliminating low-value customers and clients. Now, some of them will say, all right, well, I'm leaving. And they'll leave with their $1 and go somewhere else. There are others who will say, okay, I don't have a problem paying 10 and they'll pay 10 But you got to have that conversation. So what we're going to be doing is removing your lowest tier of offerings, raising that level up, such that the people who are there need to level up their buy-in in order to stay in your world. So it doesn't necessarily mean, again, you're not necessarily removing them. They will remove themselves or eliminate themselves if they decide they don't want to uh, level themselves up to the level that you are demanding. This is very important for those of you who are in client-based businesses because there is a service that must be rendered to the people who you are working with, right? You got to deliver, deliver them a service. Now, your staff can help with this, depending on the type of business that you have. I know some people who are in service-based businesses in the uh, financial space, like tax, accounting, uh, financial advising, for example. You have other advisors working with you. You can take some of your lower tier clients and pass them off to that other person while you focus on serving the higher tier individuals. But you have to commit yourself to this because, listen, the lower tier clients who are used to working directly with you, some of them will bristle at the idea of now being passed off to someone else and they some of them will be able to read in between the lines as to why you're doing it they're looking at you like oh well i don't i'm not doing enough in business or i don't have enough uh money for you to manage for you to get you to pay attention to me so you pass me off to the, the b team and then you're going to be focused on the people who have a little bit more money and people will some people may take that personally some of your clients might not like that some of them may take their business with them because of the fact that you're doing it and the question is not whether or not this is going to happen if you enact what I'm talking about. The question is, what are you going to do when it happens? Are you going to stick to your guns and continue to level up? Or are you going to talk yourself into, let me just keep doing the same thing that I'm doing and hope that it gets better? See, this is why you need to be in the university. So if you're not charging enough for what you're offering, folks, this is one of the reasons why we have to eliminate the lower tier clients and customers, because you're not charging enough in order for you to generate the revenue that you want to generate. So if you want to make a lot more money, then clearly one of the reasons is the people who are paying you now ain't paying you enough, which means we got to do something about that equation. Well, we got to do something about it. There's only so much effort you can keep giving to solve the problem. We got to get strategic about this rather than just let me just work harder. So you can't if you're not charging enough for what you offer, you can't give the people who you are serving the value that you want to give them. And the longer that goes on, uh, only a, there's only a few things that can possibly happen. Number one, you just talk yourself into this is okay and your dreams die at that point when you tell yourself that this is okay, I'm just leave it as it is. That can happen. B, you can start to resent your clients because you're mad that you're servicing these people who are not worth the time that you're giving them, but you're the one who set the price. All right, so who you mad at? Them or yourself? But you may start to resent them. Or C, you're not able to get them as, as much value as you want to give them. So maybe they start to feel like they're not getting their money's worth. And they leave you and they're the ones who was paying a lower price in the first place. You should have left them before they left you. But since you didn't do anything about it, they did something about it. These are the only possible outcomes. So how about, instead of all of this, you just have fewer low-value people and free up your resources, like your time and attention, to focus on higher-value people. And again, some of your low-value people may become higher-value people when you give them a mandate to become one. But if you're just hoping that they become one, probably ain't going to happen. See, this will, as a general rule, lower the number of people you have in volume to serve. But depending on your mathematics, it will often increase the total returns that you create in your business, that you generate in your business. 
Now, this is hard to do simply because the people at the lowest tier, when I say hard to do, I mean eliminating the lowest, lowest value people. People at the lowest tier are usually the most numerous. I mean, it's like a pyramid. Right? There are more people at the bottom of the pyramid than at the top of the pyramid, which is a higher number of people. More people will pay $1 than they'll pay $5 as a general rule. And there are more people paying $5 than are paying 10 and more people paying 10 than are paying 20 as a general rule. So eliminating all the $1 people means eliminating a lot of people. And a lot of them are not going to move up with you when you ask them to move up. Question is, are you okay with that? Not if, and if this is going to happen. It is going to happen. Question is, are you all right? With it? If you're all right with it, then we can move forward. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, six scary things every forward-thinking entrepreneur must do. Embrace your unique ability. What does that mean? Unique ability does not mean a specific thing that you do. It doesn't mean a specific action. But it means a certain way of being within a certain context through which you do it. I'll give you an example. Uh, my unique ability is not uh, recording this show or writing books or coaching or any of those things. My unique ability is taking a complex topic, breaking it down, and putting it back together in a way that anyone can understand and appreciate. That is my unique ability. I used this unique ability as an athlete when I first started breaking down basketball on YouTube back in the day. I used this unique ability as a writer, writing my articles, blogs, and books. I used this unique ability as a speaker. I use this ability right here on this very show. I use this unique ability when I uh, coach people. I use this unique ability even in daily one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. All right, this is a unique ability because it is transferable amongst different uh, avenues, different uh, platforms, and is not connected to any specific activity because activities can come and go. Activities can end. One day I may decide I don't want to do the show anymore, but the, my unique ability goes with me when I leave. There was a time when I decided I wasn't going to make basketball videos anymore, but my unique ability to break things down and help people understand them came with me to the world that I'm in now. My unique ability worked for me as an athlete. Now I work with mostly entrepreneurs. The unique ability is transferable. That's the point. Your unique ability is not tied to what you do for a living. I'm a doctor. I'm a nurse. I'm a coach. I'm an author. No, that is not a unique ability. That's a job. The unique ability is how you do it in the context in which you do it. So these days, my unique ability is related to mindset, strategy, systems, and accountability. But hey, I may, one day I may change that. But the unique ability will always come with me. I can take this unique ability to a show, a book, a speaking gig, a one-on-one -on -one consultation, many other places. And you need to figure out what yours is. Your unique ability should be transferable no matter what job you're doing, what industry you're in. You could be an accountant, decide you want to quit, and you want to be a, a, a business coach. And your unique ability should come with you, but you need to know what it is. So you are not tying yourself to any particular space. The more you embrace your unique ability, the higher your perceived value, both by you and the people whom you serve, because you're offering something that is, again, key word, unique. Nobody else can do it. See, other people can have a show. Other people can get videos on YouTube. Other people can write books and write articles and emails and and coach. There are other coaches out there. There are other people who can do all the things. If I just name my job, there are other people who can do them. Nothing unique about that. But my specific ability that I just explained to you, taking a complex topic, breaking it down, putting it back together in a way that anyone can understand and appreciate, even if they know nothing about the topic, that is a unique ability. All right, there's nobody who can beat me at that. You need to figure out what your unique ability is. The more you embrace it, first of all, you got to know what it is. The more you embrace it, the higher your perceived value. Many entrepreneurs for them, it is difficult because we usually tether ourselves to a certain activity or space. And this is not just entrepreneurs, all people. We tether ourselves to what we do, like whatever is written on our business card, rather than our unique ability. Lucky thing for me is that I always understood I had this ability even when I was playing sports, but I never limited myself to just sports because I knew at some point sports was going to be over anyway. So let me figure out what is unique about what I'm bringing to the table so that when sports is over, I still got something to you know, bring, to the, bring to the conversation. All that said, let's recap these points here today. Again, this is part one of two. Six scary things every entrepreneur must do. Number one, delegate and invest in efficiency. That means passing work that you don't need to be doing. It needs to be done, but you don't need to be doing it. Off to another person, app, software, etc. This is scary for you because you may not be used to delegating. Maybe you're not used to giving up control. You're not used to not looking over everybody's shoulder. And maybe somebody's just not as good as you at doing that thing. But again, we got to be clear on whether or not it matters how good that thing is done good enough it's good enough good enough in many places it is number two 
eliminate low value clients and customers. It doesn't necessarily mean you got to kick them out, but it means you raise your raise the investment required in order for people to work with you. And the lower tier people are either going to go away or they're going to raise up with you and or other option is you can pass those people off to be in service to someone else. So you don't have to deal with them, even though you can still make money from them. So again, depending on how your business is structured, you may be able to do that as well. But either way, you must eliminate you having to serve those people. And this will be a big bulk of the people you serve because there are more people at the lower tier of the pyramid than there are at the top tier of the pyramid just by just as a general rule. Number three, embrace your unique ability. Again, this is not related to having a certain job or doing a certain task. It is an ability that is transferable no matter what you do for a living. It is based on you as a person and what makes you unique, not what makes what you do unique. And there's a big difference between the two. When you're clear on that, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. That unique ability is the main thing that's going to make you stand out and make people come into your world. Another piece of my uh, unique ability from what I explained there now that I'm talking about it is just the, the way that I deliver what I deliver. People like the fact that I look at things uh, from multiple angles, that I can be objective about things, that I don't uh, tie myself to one specific uh, point of view, that I keep my opinions flexible. All of that, that's kind of the delivery, the delivery of my unique angle. And that is a unique ability as well. So just want to throw that in that I'm thinking about. All that out the way. Tomorrow we'll get into part two of this series, Six Scary Things Every Entrepreneur Needs to Do. Make sure you are texting me so you're in my text community. My number is 305-384-6894 and workingagainuniversity.com. If you want to work with me directly, that's the only place that it happens. That link and the number is down below in the description. Work on your game. Dre, all day.